You're listening to Mind Pump, the world's top fitness, health, and entertainment uh, podcast. Now, in this episode, we talk all about purpose. Now, I remember uh, when I was younger, I used to think purpose was overrated. So what's the big deal? If I'm having fun and enjoying myself, why does everybody always talk about purpose? Well, as we got older, uh, we all realized that the key to success in life, fulfillment, is in finding purpose. But boy, that's a lot easier said than done. So in this episode, we talk all about finding purpose and what that looks like and why it's important to find purpose in your life. Now, this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Paleo Valley. Now, Paleo Valley makes some pretty incredible uh, supplements, uh, but one of our favorite products from Paleo Valley are their grass-fed meat sticks. This is the best jerky you've ever had in your entire life. Great macros, of course, high in protein, no carbohydrates. They're not dry. Uh, they taste really, really good. Uh, they're literally the best tasting meat sticks uh, we've ever had ever. And again, they're grass fed, so they have a better fatty acid profile. Now, because you listen to Mind Pump, you actually get a discount. Just go to paleovalley.com forward slash Mind Pump and then use the code Mind Pump 15. That's Mind Pump 15 for 15% off your first order. Also, we are running a huge holiday ultimate at home workout bundle. Okay. So this is for everybody who likes to work out at home. We combined two of our most popular programs, Maps Anywhere and Maps Suspension. Maps Anywhere uses body weight and resistance bands. Maps Suspension is a suspension trainer workout program. Now you can get both of them for $99.99, but here's how it gets even crazier. Okay. We're also going to throw in Maps Hit. Maps Hit is a high intensity interval training program designed to burn a lot of body fat, a lot of calories in a short period of time. So you heard that correctly. All three programs Maps Anywhere, Maps Suspension, and then we threw in Maps Hit all for $99.99. All of those retail for over $290. Here's how you take advantage of this huge promotion. Just go to mapsnovember.com. That's maps, M-A-P-S, november.com. You know, I was reading a, a, an article by uh, Arthur Brooks. He, wrote an, he writes for The Atlantic, and uh, I love reading his stuff. Uh, great writer. Always has such a good, pragmatic, positive uh, view on things. But there was something really interesting um, in that article. So number one, obviously he's uh, very well versed in economics. It's part of what he does. Um, but he cited, uh, I think it was a study um, where some economists take numbers, crunch them to see how much more or less wealthy we were today versus in the past, adjusted for inflation. And what they found, and these are just hard numbers, was that that today in all categories, from the, the lower, uh, middle to upper class, um, everybody in America today adjusted for inflation um, is far wealthier and has more purchasing power and uh, just generally, materially speaking, mm -hmm. much better off. Here's the crazy part. Depression's on the rise. People claim to be more unhappy. Dude, all so this is the weird part. Since 1988, uh, happiness, joy, purpose, meaning, like all those positive uh, things – have been on a slow decline since mm. 1988. Ever since the Reagan years. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know what's crazy about this is that we, we have more stuff, more entertainment, bigger houses. The average American today lives in a thousand square feet bigger living space than they did um, you know, 60 or 70 years ago. Um, there are we live longer. There's lower crime. Crime is much lower than it was in 1988 across the, the country. This is a fact. Mm. Um, so for all intents and purposes, you would not expect to see that that people are less happy, and yet that's what they're finding. Well, I think it's because we are a consumer-based society now. Mm -hmm. Everything's based around that. And we, we've been advertised to that since the 30s, right? That this is what makes you happy. Mm -hmm. uh, all the commercials and ads and... You know, we continue to buy all these things, and and I think why it's why it's worked for so long is a lot of those things do give a temporary excitement and joy, mm -hmm. right? So I think you when you initially 
buy something, whether it be a new car, a pair of tennis shoes, whatever it is, that the, the first purchase, and then when you get them, there is a little bit of excitement and joy, but it's fleeting after that. And then I think it just feeds into this vicious cycle of trying to fill this empty hole because you haven't found purpose in your life. And so you're trying to fill it with all these goods. And when you add in that with the marketing and the advertising and the way this whole machine works, it's tough to break out of that. And I think what we're finding today is that we can have so much more. You know, we, we've talked about this before on the podcast that, you know, we're not far away from everybody, everybody being able to have most things, mm-hmm. which is which is so different than what it was just a hundred years ago, right? Like, oh well, today somebody who's poor has th- access to things that the wealthiest people of all time two hundred years ago didn't have because they didn't exist. Well, you don't got to go that far. You can just say something like a television, correct? Uh, somebody who c- could be on welfare, right, mm-hmm. and struggling to get by, living paycheck to paycheck, or not having a paycheck at all. Uh, I think average household has one and a half TVs or two and a half TVs in their house. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just, you know, 50, 60 years ago, that was a big deal. If if you had one, it was a big deal. So Right. I, I mean, hunger hunger has largely been solved in yeah. modern societies to the point where in America, you're far more likely to die of too much food than too little food. Well, and it, it makes me think too. I remember we were talking with Justin Wren and he's out there trying to help people that have dirty water still, but... Well, his experience was that they were some of the most happy people that he's ever been around. We are searching for the answers uh, in places where the answers don't exist. Yeah. Is what uh, I, you know? What Arthur Brooks talks about, and what psychologists and scientists are talking about. Um, a sense of purpose and meaning cannot be found with the ways that I think people are trying to find them. That doesn't mean it's not good that we're innovating and creating new products and making life easier. Mm-hmm. That's all good. It's not bad but it's not gonna solve uh, this problem. Studies show that having a sense, a strong sense of purpose are very protective to your health. Um, it's You're less likely to have Alzheimer's disease. You live longer if you get cancer or get very ill. Uh, people with a higher, uh, with, a, with a good sense of purpose have greater, far greater emotional recovery mm-hmm. when terrible things uh, happen to them. It's a very important uh, overall measure of your health or factor that contributes to, you know, generally speaking, your, just your total health. I've personally seen this too with um, people who are retiring and they don't really have anything oh, yeah. lined up after that. The slow decline, it, it turns into a rapid decline, like right in front of uh, of my eyes. And, and this happened to a few of my dad's friends, unfortunately have passed. Uh, and really it was once one of the partners passed, then they passed mm-hmm. and, and they just didn't recreate that purpose uh, to carry them on uh, from then on out. Well, again, I think that's another narrative that we're, we're playing out that was told to us, right? We're supposed to go to these jobs. We're supposed to work really hard, buy the house that, uh, we live in, uh, spend most of your life trying to pay it off, put a bunch of money away in savings and retirement, and then finally re- retirement happens, mm-hmm. and now life is just supposed to be yeah. so Now grand. you're supposed to enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, and then what you find is, and I've, I've seen the same thing too myself. I'd love to see some actually uh, research on this. I'm sure there are some studies yeah. to support what we're talking about. Oh, yeah, and there, there is uh, there's a, a marked spike in death and illness right after retirement, and they know that that's one of the reasons mm-hmm. why is that they think it's because people lose that drive and purpose that they maybe had from mm-hmm. the work or career that Their they had. Their identity was all wrapped up in that. Yes. Yeah. It, purpose, it, the reason why it's so important, well, first off, it makes life uh, bearable, even easy life. You know, uh, what we're seeing now, studies are showing that you have kids or people in their 20s and 30s who they have a job, they have everything, they're at home or in their apartment, and they're just – depressed they're, or, or, or flat or anxious, um, and they can't figure out what the hell's going on. But on the other end, uh, this is why it's really important, a sense of purpose makes the hard parts of life bearable. This is the most important thing because I don't care who you are. Mm-hmm. I don't care how much money you have or, or whatever. You are, there is something hard is going to happen to you in your life at some point, um, or several things are going to happen to you that are really hard. And a sense of purpose is what makes those things uh, bearable. Without a sense of purpose, when you get hit in the face with something very difficult, you just want to die. You know, this reminds me of uh, uh, my very first client when I had my own personal training studio. So 
you know, years ago when I left the, the big box gyms, um, you know, I, I did a little stint in investments and then I opened up a personal training studio. And I remember uh, my first studio was in the back of a tanning salon and there was a lady that was walking around and I introduced myself and she ended up becoming my very first uh, client. And so I started training her for a little while. And anyway, long story short, she became a trainer and fitness became her life. But I remember when I was training her about, it was about six months in and personal training's you know, relatively expensive. It's not inexpensive. Uh, I think at the time I was charging 70 or $80 uh, an hour a session. And I remember her husband and, and they were straight middle class, right? And I remember her husband calling me and saying, Hey, Sal, when, um, you know, I don't want to use her name, but he said, when, when her sessions are done, tell me, cause this is really making a big difference. And then he proceeded to tell me, um, that, I think it was something like five years prior, their son had been hit by a drunk driver. He was a 18 year old kid, 19 year old kid. And he got hit and was killed. And I can't even imagine what, what that must've been like. Yeah. Um, so I was training her and that helped her quite a bit. And l a couple of years later, she opened up and talked about it. And I would ask her questions and I said, how did you get through that? You know, by that point I had my son. And so I, I you know, once you have kids, if you ever hear about someone losing a kid, you think, wow, I don't know how you could possibly survive that. And she said, my daughter is what kept me alive. I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, I have the older sister. If I didn't have her, I would have had no purpose to continue going. It was that, that right there that pulled me through that incredibly difficult time because I had to stay strong and sane and healthy to raise her. So that sense of purpose made the, the most, to me, something that sounds absolutely unbearable possible uh, or bearable because of that sense of purpose. You know? I, you know, I can remember when, uh, you know, I first figured out that what I had been driving towards most of my life, uh, was not fulfilling, uh, not the way I thought it was. And I think there's gotta be, you know, a percentage of people that are listening that have something similar where they, maybe they think that they have found their purpose and they're driving towards it and they, and then they reach it and they get there and they realize like, maybe that's not what it was all supposed to be right you know for me i was i was so driven by uh money and and ha reaching a place financially uh where i thought okay i would never have to worry about money i'd have my house i'd never have to worry about money again if i'd put enough in the bank or invest enough or have enough of my savings that um i will have made it and at that point i'll be happy you know this this will be it and i, and I guess a lot of that you know, internal conversation didn't happen exactly like that. I think, you know, I just, I'm put into certain circumstances as a child when we're younger. We don't have a lot of things like that. So internally, I'm driven to change that. And that's all that I'm focused. So I have this tunnel vision for, you know, 20 years of my life. And I remember waking up, um, you know, in my mid to late 20s, around 27, 28. Uh, and I had more money in the bank account. Um, I had a place where I literally didn't have to work for a while, had my house and felt that I had reached this number that I had decided that this was it. Like if I, once I make this much, you know, and what I thought was that was going to be like kind of a lifelong pursuit for me to get there. So it seemed like this was a good purpose. And I remember really sitting back and kind of evaluating my life and going like, wow, my health was in the worst I had been in at that point. Um, I had some, uh, relate the the girl that I was dating at the time had just recently cheated on me, so I was in the middle of a breakup. I had just lost a best friend of mine, um, and not to death, but to us no longer being friends anymore. So we were on the outs. My two closest friends and I weren't spending as much time together. And when I started to look at all the other things in my life, I was like, "Wow, this is crazy." This thing that I thought was so important that I was driving towards that I thought was my purpose. I'd kind of reached it. And when I really evaluated all the other aspects of my life, I was actually at some of the unhappiest times of my life. And was that, that must have been a hard realization. It was. Um, it was it was it was hard, but then there was there was actually for me, there was a moment of a little bit of like depressed feeling, like, oh shit, this isn't what it's supposed to be. But then there was also for me a, a, a weight that was lifted off, like I got to that place because uh, of out of fear, right? I was I was driven towards the money thing because I was afraid of being poor. Mm -hmm. That was the story that I was telling myself in my head for so long. 
And then once I had reached that and realized, okay, I'm not going to be poor. I'm going to be okay. Um, but this isn't what makes me happy. There was kind of this relief that of this weight coming off my shoulders of, oh, wow, now I can actually focus on maybe what truly drives me and makes mm. me happy and not driving myself out of fear. And so I, my point of sharing that is sometimes we're driven towards what we think is our purpose because we're still running from something that is rooted in our childhood or that we're fearful of. And because it, that gave me purpose, mm. I thought it was the right purpose. And it wasn't until I obtained that that I realized that this isn't my purpose. This is not why I was put here. And this doesn't actually make me happy. So a little bit of depression at first, but then it was this weight off my shoulders. Okay, now let's begin seeking what is really going to give me true purpose. Yeah, and I think that brings us to the first, uh, probably most one of the more important points, which is to practice gratitude. And I think that's probably what took you out of that little depressed feeling, right? You started mm. feeling grateful Right. For figuring that out, um, I know I've told this. I haven't told this story in a long time on the podcast, but in my early 30s, uh, now up until that point, working in fitness, training clients, body obsessed myself. Obviously, I was driven by same you know insecurities about you know being a skinny kid or whatever. So I, I kind of identified with being this muscular, strong, you know, fit trainer, and uh, my health took a turn and you know rebelled on me essentially and i remember i could no matter what i ate i had severe digestional issues i was losing weight i lost almost 15 pounds in a, in a, in a couple months which to somebody who's identifies with their body mm -hmm. works in fitness and thinks they know it all you want to talk about an ego check i can't even stop my body from from getting skinny and, and, and feeling weak people you know clients commenting my family asking me what's going on doctors couldn't figure it out and I went on this journey of focusing on health rather than focusing on what I looked like. So I did the whole thing, right? I did elimination diet and I figured out um, how to treat my gut issues and I stopped focusing so much on what I look like. And uh, what at the end of it, really what ended up happening is I ended up really developing the voice that I have now on the podcast. Like how I talk about health and fitness came from that moment. And it was the gratitude that I had because during that period of time was hard, believe it, not easy, right? It's not easy eating food and it not work, no matter what you do and counter to all the things that you think are right. I mean, I'm eating all the stuff I think is healthy. It's just not working. And I remember there was a point where I had, I became grateful and I said, you know what? This is going to force me to look at things a little different. This is going to force me to face things that I haven't faced um, in, in terms of my relationship to exercise and to nutrition. Um, and it was that that got me out of it. And, and that's really important. It's, it's that practicing gratitude. But it's not practicing gratitude when it's obvious. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, you win the lottery or yeah. you hit a home run. I'm so grateful. You know, pra this really only works when you're – and you got to be grateful for when that stuff too. When you're in the thick of it. That's it. Yeah. you got to be grateful when shit's hard. I can remember that too. And that – you know, from coming back from going to school across the country and trying to figure out what I was going to do for a career and trying to please everybody around me, uh, I was very reactionary to life. And, and this was a, a thing that I realized um, I was I hadn't found my purpose yet. And, and I was unhappy and I was I was pretty much like just facing whatever adversity or whatever uh, obstacle was in front of me uh, just based off of, uh, you know, the odds, what I was going to face for that day. Uh, and it was really until I started to focus specifically on things that I was very grateful for that were in my life at the time. And then uh, things that I really enjoyed uh, a part of my day from my job or from the activities I was doing, I started to really focus my efforts around those things that it started to reveal itself for me. And so it wasn't even until I, I could corral my thoughts and sort of gain the, you know, the, the, the steering wheel and take myself to where I wanted to go. Uh, but I had to, I had to practice gratitude. I had to, I had to be able to see the those things that were right in front of me that were otherwise just uh, invisible. Oh, it's a great practice. It's like, think of a, a challenging, difficult thing that's happening to you now um, or maybe happened to you in the past, um, something that you're struggling with. Um, and it can be, and it, can be, it can be a lot of, it can be something that's really terrible. You could have lost a loved one or have a spouse that cheated on you 
or you came, came down with an illness that maybe to this day affects you. Um, and think about something you'd be grateful about, about that moment. And that's a really hard thing to do. You know, especially if you're thinking about someone that you lost, that you loved, like, what am I grateful about? What are you talking about? I lost my, my best friend. Something came out of that that you can look back at and say, you know what, though? I'm grateful for this. It forced me to be a better person or it forced me to value my relationships differently or it forced me to change this thing about myself because that gives purpose and meaning to the difficult uh, parts of your life, that type of gratitude. That's what practicing gratitude literally means. Well, I, I think too, you have to, you have to practice gratitude first before you can become fully present because it's interesting creatures we are, right? We have these, we set these goals and we're constantly focused on this destination that we want to get to. Uh, meanwhile, our, our life is like, full of all these little hidden gems and moments and things for us to be happy and grateful for. But mm -hmm. many times we don't stop. We don't uh, even acknowledge them. Yeah, we don't because we're, we're not present. We're, we're focused on the next thing. Yeah. We're focused on uh, a, a, a goal or a place that we want to get. And, and we fail to be grateful and become present with what's right in front of us. And so I think in order to be present, and w which we talk about on this show at, at nauseum uh, in this time that it's so important with all the distraction we have, in order to get there, you must first learn to be grateful for the things that you do have. When you are grateful for the things that you do have, then you start to slow down those moments and slow down those days. Like, I work so hard to provide for my family because I want to be a good father, but not at the <laughs> not at the trade off of not being present as a dad, right? So you have to remember those things. Like, and at, at the, we always use, uh, we talk about how at someone's deathbed, they never stop. No one ever said, like, oh, I wish I would have worked 10 more hours and made <laughs> X amount more money. Yeah. So I, think about that. I was thinking too about, you know, how you buy a car and then you see cars that are the same everywhere, yeah. like immediately. And that's, that's how I look at too, how I was looking at all my problems. At, at one point I was seeing problems. I could see all kinds of problems all of a sudden spurring like every day. I was like, oh my God, all this stuff is happening to me. It's all happening to me. Uh, versus when I started to start really looking at uh, positive things that were happening and uh, things that uh, that I was enjoying. And, and man, all of a sudden now those are starting to pop up everywhere. Well, and what we start to, you know, the more you practice this, um, and it's hard, right? You guys are talking about, you know, deaths in the family and these really challenging things. But the the greater the challenge, the greater the reward is on the other side of it, right? So when you become really present and you practice this gratitude, then you start to look at these difficult times in your life and you recognize them as, oh, wow, this may present actually the most opportunity for growth. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful for this situation. It completely reframes the situation that you're going through, instead of it being something that is, oh my God, poor me, this is terrible, this sucks. It's like, of course, there's nothing wrong with grieving over somebody who died in your family or going through hardship and knowing like, oh man, this sucks, it's hard. But then also recognizing like, oh wow, this is also going to present one hell of an opportunity for me to grow and become a better version of myself. Practicing gratitude helps you when you're in those moments, training for when you're in those moments. If yep. you're constantly training yourself like that. And that's why you have so many books that are written around, you know, things like this, like the last 15 minutes before bed of sitting down and writing your five or seven or 10 things yeah. you're grateful for in the day. All that is, it's not like there's something magical about doing that one time. It's you're training yourself to think that way. So, so that when you get hit with adversity, you get hit with these challenging moments, you don't you don't dwell in them for weeks and months and spiral into depression. You have the ability right away to reframe and be grateful for the that's situation. The, that's the most important point. Yeah. That's why it's practice. Uh, it's not, um, you know, remind yourself or try to be, you practice it so it becomes automatic. Then it becomes your go-to when things get difficult. Um, but it does take consistent practice, just like you know, if you want to get good at a squat, um, you have to practice the squat constantly to get really good at it. Same thing is uh, with, with gratitude. Um, now, the next one, this one's interesting because um, studies will show that people who volunteer, okay, volunteer workers, people who work for charities, don't get paid anything. They work the hardest. They tend to work the most hours oftentimes. And simultaneously, they have some of the highest work satisfaction, yet they're not getting paid. So that brings us to the second one, which is learn to serve others. Um, and I've experienced this 
uh, myself many, many times, you know, doing things for other people, not for money, not for, uh, not even to get recognized, but just for the sake of it. Like I'm doing this for this other person, even if they don't recognize it, even if other people don't see it, that gives you a really, really good, strong um, sense of, of purpose and meaning. This is something that, you know, I've, I've learned from friends of mine that, that have done this with their kids. You know, I have some friends that are very, very successful and wealthy, and we talk sometimes about how to you know, make sure your kids grow up and realize their, you know, how lucky they are to, to grow up with such nice things and to be so privileged. And um, they tell me that one of the best things they did is have their children mm -hmm. go on like these, you know, six month missions or whatever, where they go and they build houses for people or feed people or work for other people for free. And he says they come, you know, they, they came back totally different. I remember when I trained, uh, when I was a personal trainer, I had a, a, lot of, a lot of clients that were doctors. And there were a couple of them that did that. I think it's called Doctors Without Borders, where they travel uh -huh. and they'll do work and stuff. And it's totally on their time. They're not getting, you know, these are high paid, very busy surgeons. Um, and they're busy anyway. They already work tons of hours anyway. And they'll take a month or two months and go fly somewhere and live in some, you know, hut or, you know, be share a room with a bunch of beds with other doctors, do their services for free. And when they'll come back, they're tired, exhausted, but they all say by far that's, that is so much more meaning, more meaningful than, than what I do yeah. at work anyway, because they're serving other people. Yeah. It provides perspective. It, it, it allows you to, peer into somebody else's life that, you know, and their, their struggles are no different. I mean, they're, they're different, but, um, everybody, everybody's going through life through adversity and, you know, finding their, their way through. And if you can help somebody, that's very rewarding back, uh, you know, to you being involved in helping somebody through that. And I think a lot of times this is just good to break that sort of loop that we get in about thinking about our own problems, our own things that are happening to us constantly. It helps you to now be able to kind of relief, relieve, release yourself from that uh, constant thought process and really just pour yourself into somebody else and lift them up. I also think that um, it's a very powerful tool. So even though this isn't the intent that I think you go into this, uh, but it's something that I've recognized over years of being in business and then also helping other entrepreneurs that want to scale or be better at what they do is, you know, leading with a, a service mind first. And, you know, some of the best and most successful people that I've ever met understand this really well. Um, they look for things that they can do for you. And if you do that without thinking like, oh, what am I going to get in return? Like you truly do it to help others and be of service to other people. It does come back tenfold. It's the most amazing thing ever. When you spend a life of being that person where you're truly trying to give and help others, there's a percentage of those people that will also return that favor. And it's a compounding thing that you do over years and years and years. It's never, equity. Yeah, it's absolutely. It's equity. And I'll never forget the first time that I went to a funeral of a man that I think really understood this. And I'll never forget seeing just like hundreds and hundreds of people that were lining up to, to speak to the wife afterwards because of the, li the life that he led of giving to others. And it's like, it gets me emotional just thinking about it, how powerful that is. It's like, you can become the richest man in the world by working really hard and saving your money and investing well, and then you die and nobody gives a shit. You know, maybe the, those that are closest to you care a little bit, but then nobody ever talks about you. Nobody ever thinks about you ever again. You're, you're now gone from this earth. But take that same person that dedicated their life to serving others versus trying to serve themselves all the time. And those people will speak volumes of that person for an eternity. They'll be talked about all the time about the type of life that they led. It was a very powerful moment for me when I, when I saw that it completely reframed the way how I look at success. And I remember thinking to myself like, man, and I, I've said this before in my interviews and it always comes off terrible because it sounds like, a like I have a massive ego or narcissistic over it. Like when I say that when I die, you know, what I, I would love to fill a stadium full of people and not because I'm famous, but because I've impacted so many lives. I've done so much for other people that they feel that they want to come there to pay their respects. And when I say it, it comes off as this narcissistic guy who wants to have thousands of people, you know, going to his funeral. Guns and Roses playing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
but it's really not about that. What it's really about is that, you know, have I led a life like that, that I've truly tried to serve and help other people so much and to so many that that many people think about me when I pass, pass away. And I just think that uh, finding your purpose, part of that, that work is going in to serve others and it's extremely rewarding when you piece it together. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, now the next one, this one, you know, studies show is actually quite important, but we're going to break it down a little bit because it can mean a few different things and that's to practice uh, spirituality. Um, now that can mean religion. It can mean connecting with nature for some people, meditation um, and, you know, working on awareness for other people. But the reason why this is important is because it helps you realize things that are bigger than you and bigger than life. Mm -hmm. And I know some people think like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't want to worship anything or I don't worship anything. That's actually false. Okay. We all worship something. Whatever your top value is, is what you end up worshiping. So whether that be, you know, God or money or power or honor um, it's your actions uh, reflect what you actually worship. It's what drives all your decisions ends up being what you worship. And if what you worship is something that is bigger than you, something that is uh, perfect, mm -hmm. something that is um, maybe even esoteric, um, that can really give things a lot of purpose and meaning um, versus something material um, spirituality is immaterial. That's what the, that's, you know, if, if spirituality is not something, it's not something, uh, that is material, you know, like, uh, worshiping money or power or sex, you get those things and you realize, you know, now what, um, spirituality is bigger than you. And yeah. in, in lots and lots and lots of studies show that people, and the studies are done on religious people, uh, mainly because that's the more classic, uh, example of spirituality. It's the one we have lots of examples of. People who are deeply religious live longer, get sick less, are healthier, and have much more um, joyful lives. They report more joyful lives, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that they have this spiritual practice that gives good things meaning, but even more importantly, gives bad things uh, meaning. Yeah, it's interesting if you think about it logically, uh, and you know, and you're not a religious person, but you think of the idea of the perfect. Uh, version, the perfect being that you could try to be like, but you never really can achieve that. But your whole goal in life is to sharpen what you're doing, get better and, and constantly grow. Uh, if you look at it like that, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, even to somebody who maybe not be that religious, uh, you know, have, have that right. kind of background. Well, this follows the, the last one really well, right? You so you alluded to that everybody worships something based off of what you do. So even if you're not religious, you're either chasing honor, power, money, all these things, right? Mm -hmm. But all those things are very selfish. They're all self-centered, right? Honor, power, money. These are all things that- Pleasure, I think. And they're the fulfillable one. too. Right. right. And, they're, and they all serve me versus serving others. And so the reason why I think that the, there's such strong cases for why this is so good and religion is a good example of that is because I think it lays the blueprint out for most people that don't understand how to pursue this. So if you're a non-religious person, I, I believe that the key to this is, is selflessness. It's it's a lot of that, is recognizing that there's, there's other things other than yourself or serving yourself that is greater than you. And, mm -hmm. and, and why now, and, and that's a great point because you think yourself, well, okay, well, what's spiritual about that? Well, it's not because objectively speaking, it doesn't make sense. And so what I mean by that is if I were to sit here without a spiritual practice and say, what makes the most sense? What should I do in my life? Well, I should do everything that makes me f for me. Right. It doesn't make sense to do things for other people. Like a pleasure monkey. Yeah, it's exactly. It's got to be all for me, that's objectively true, right? And I could make a case for it objectively. I could make a case. Why are you helping those people over there, giving them their, your money? Or why are you devoting your time and getting tired when you could be going and having fun doing stuff for you? Life becomes very self-centered mm -hmm. when you don't have a spiritual practice. When you have a spiritual practice, it's not about you anymore. Now it's about other. It's about whether it be God or other people. It's about serving other people. And 
you know, religious leaders, I know Bishop Barron calls it uh, spiritual physics, that mm -hmm. the more you serve, the more energy you get back, the more you put out love, the more love you get back. It's totally true. Mm -hmm. I've never felt more, I've never felt better than exhausting myself serving others. You know what I mean? It feels much better um, from a spiritual sense than, than doing things just for me. And so in order to overcome your natural objective, th that natural uh, desire to always serve yourself, spirituality helps you uh, overcome that. Well, why am I doing things for other people? Um, well, because I'm connected to everybody. That might be a, a form of spirituality. You know, everybody's connected. You hear people say that. Or I, be or I worship God, and God says that this is what we do, so I serve others. So this is very, very important to helping people find purpose. And studies, if you're just a science-driven person, by the way, studies prove this, that spiritual practices really help lead to this. Um, but again, just like the others, it is a practice. So just like if you want strong muscles, it doesn't happen from one workout. It doesn't happen from two workouts. It doesn't happen from inconsistent workouts. It happens from consistency, and it happens from consistency over a long period of time. Like you don't work out for a month and then stop every year or whatever. You do it all the time. Spirituality is like that as well. You practice it on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, and you do it consistently. And part of that, I think, is goes to our next point, which is you know seeking vulnerability. You know things that make you feel uncomfortable or that are challenging you know uh it's like anything that is comes easy is never rewarding and even if it feels good for a minute it's a moment and then it's gone it's the things that took a long time or that were challenging or challenged you you were scared you were nervous it was hard this is out of your comfort zone those are the things that are going to give you the greatest purpose and some people get this really early on and then they become, they, they're fear seekers. Like and that's mm -hmm. face your fears, right? I feel like when you, when you figure this, you unlock this, like, oh, wow, the worst that happens is failure. The worst that happens is I fall down. I can always get back up mm -hmm. again. You begin somebody, you begin to become somebody who starts to seek out all these situations where you're very vulnerable because you realize how fulfilling it is and how rewarding it is to be chasing it. Well, do you guys remember, can you remember a time when you opened yourself up and were very vulnerable to your partner where you said something that maybe you revealed something that you really don't like to reveal to anybody else because you're either ashamed or embarrassed or because it makes you feel weak uh, or, or not strong and then they hear it and they accept it, and then they love you, and you never feel closer than you do in that moment because being vulnerable allows now, – now here's why it's vulnerable. You open yourself up to ridicule. Mm -hmm. You open yourself up to shame. You, it's like swinging – it's like playing a sport versus not playing the sport. If you play it, you, you, you're in the risk of losing. If you don't, then you'll never win or lose. You never have any risk, right? When you make yourself vulnerable, you run the risk of getting crushed, but if you don't yeah. – you, that's how you get very close. It's also what makes you grow. It's that self-growth. That's what drives growth. It's In almost fact, the definition of love, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you, you're not really going to love somebody unless you're vulnerable and, and, you, and you give them all of yourself versus just a portion of it so you don't get hurt because of the rejection or whatever it is, you know, uh, that, that, you're, that you're withholding. And so it's, it really is. It's an all in kind of an approach and, and to do, to be all in and to find your purpose, you really do need to uh, put those uncomfortable parts out and, and allow uh, uh, what, what's to unfold to unfold. Yeah. And you, you, you can't grow when you're comfortable, nothing on the body changes, nothing in the mind or the spirit changes from being comfortable. First of all, change is scary. Uh, change uh, takes energy um, growth takes all those things and it doesn't happen unless you are so uncomfortable that it has to happen. Right. And so this is where self growth comes from. You never grow from doing things relaxed and whatever growth comes from doing the hard stuff. Um, and even more importantly, if you want to be able to do this repeatedly, it's to do the hard things and love the fact that they're hard. Uh, which is, you know, makes things so much, it makes it a practice. Yeah, really I was going to ask you guys if you guys subscribe to the, you know, find what you love or, or love what you do. Because yeah. there's, there's different camps, right? People that believe that, oh, seeking out something that you follow, what's the quote goes, yes. uh, if you love what you do, you never have to work another day in your life, right? So 
trying to find something that you're in love with or trying to find love within what you do. It's like yeah. millennials versus Gen Z. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. yeah, I mean, you know what? I think if you're always seeking what's gonna what you love, you're gonna be seeking a lot and you'll be bouncing from thing to thing. I think the key really is to learn to love what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, to, because that's really the, the, the trick, that's the skill. Because no matter, because remember, I think we confuse love with the feeling of love, right? Like, oh, it's the it's like feel good feeling. Well, love is an action, and uh, it, it requires um, like diligence, um, and you have to be conscious about it. Although it oftentimes does accompany a feeling, um, or come with this feeling. If you're always seeking that feeling of love, it's gonna be very hard to be consistent. It's gonna be very very hard. Um, to do to you, you'll always be on this path of, of looking. Well, yeah, I think I think one guarantees that you find purpose, and the other one doesn't. So if you are trying to find love, right, and trying to find something that you love, you may end up seeking your entire life and never find it. Mm-hmm. If you learn to love what you do, there's a very good chance that you'll fall into something that was your purpose. So it's a dangerous path, I think. That some and you, you know Justin's jab at the millennials. You know, I don't know if it's so much a age thing as much as it is there is there is definitely a a group of our population that is chasing and trying it's a to trend right trying to find purpose and uh you know i, I love what gary v always says to that you know you're, you're too young to to find purpose right now you need to eat shit for seven years and then it'll find you right yeah. and, that, and that's how i feel about it ironically and, you'll find purpose like that way yeah oh, no yeah. it's true it's just and you you love what you do you just, you've decided i've committed i'm going to do this i'm going to be the best at whatever it is i am even if it's not the thing i'm going to be doing for the rest of my life and eventually that you'll find something that you love versus I'm going to hold out and not do this and not do that because I'm pretty sure I don't love that. I'm pretty sure I don't love that. And then you end up finding yourself. You're going to train yourself to keep putting things off. Right. And and really, you just need to get in and get invested in it. And even though it's going to suck, you know that there's ways for you to reframe uh, what's in front of you and start really looking at uh, what it's teaching you, what you're learning from. I have a great example of this, right? So I hate uh, housework. I hate uh, yard work, both things I can't stand, right? I used to hate them, I should say. Um, And so when I would do them, I was like, oh, God, you know, I'm washing the dishes. I got to fold the laundry. Mm -hmm. I got to mow the lawn. This really sucks. Um, And then I had a bit of an epiphany. Um, It was exactly what we're talking about. I said, why don't I find a way to love doing this? What if I could do that? I mean, I, I, I feel like I could work on that. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a growth-oriented person. This is what I thought about myself, at least. So let me see if I can do that. And so I found that switch happen, and I found myself actually, it was quite meditative to wash dishes and to do laundry and to, to mow the lawn. All of a sudden, I found myself looking forward to being able to put my headphones on, turn on the lawnmower, mow the lawn, pay attention to the detail, rather than getting it done because I hate it so much. I actually did a better job as a result of it, and I actually found myself uh, enjoying w- what I was doing. It was really a mental switch more than anything. I didn't change anything else other than mm-hmm. the, than I said to myself, I might as well choose to learn how to like to do this since I have to do this. Yeah, you got to well, do it anyway. Yes. You just hit a very, very important key to that, I think, which is you started to do a better job. When you go mm-hmm. into, and, mm-hmm. I, and I think of like that with the workforce, because one of the things I think m- most people as you're a young gener- young kid coming up is, struggling to find purpose is the job, right? That you love to do. And one of the the great things about that is when you go into a job, and I think about like when I used to, you know, milk cows, like milking cows and shoveling shit, like there's nothing fun about that, right? This, but finding a, a way to love what I'm doing and be good at what I'm doing ends up attracting other people. I remember I got another job after that because somebody saw my work ethic mm-hmm. and saw the the success that I was having for them that had nothing to do with me loving what I was doing, but then I ended up transitioning into another job that I ended up liking more. And so a lot of times when you go into these situations that maybe you're not in love with it, but you find a way to love it and be good at it, it ends up leading to another opportunity. Oh yeah. It's, it's a, uh, I mean, it, it, you become good at everything that you do. Think mm-hmm. about that. If think about the things that you're good at, that you're really, really good at. Um, it's usually things that you enjoy. So imagine that switch. If you could make that mental switch for what you're doing at the moment, find a way to enjoy it. And then what you'll find is you do better at it. And then like anything, it, it turns into a skill um, boy, do you become, uh, I mean, dangerous in the workforce. Do you become someone that attracts other people who want to work for you? It opens up doors. I'm pretty yeah. sure it opened up doors for you, Adam, well, without you realizing. Yeah, no, that's a great uh, an example. 
Uh, I think of that as like, and again, this is this is me thinking about video games, but uh, what you learn in the hard levels, like to, to get to the next level, you have to do all of the, the hard work to get to the to the one that's going to be harder even still. And so you might not even be ready for that one yet. So if you're if you're trying to get to what you think is going to be your purpose, so I see something out there on the horizon. I'm like, oh, I want that so bad. Mm. And that's all I want. I'm going to I'm just going to like throw all these other opportunities away when all those other opportunities opportunities may have been the stepping stones you needed to learn to get to that place. Dude, I remember this made me think of a story. Um, when I was 12, I went to Sicily with my family and I had gone before, but I was real young. I think I was like two or three. So 12 was when I really remember. It was my first trip uh, when I met my dad's family that I really remembered. And um, they would tell me stories of my great grandfather, my grand, my other grandfather and uncles and you know, they 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 definitely were uh, it, it, compared to our standards. They were poor, but especially when you go into my grandfather's generation and my great grandfather's generation in Sicily were extremely poor. And they were telling me stories about my great grandfather um, and how much people loved to work with him. So in those days in Sicily, um, you either work the land or you own the land. Very few people own the land, so most people work the land. And my great grandfather, one of the things he did was help tend to these lemon orchards. Sicily's known for, for their lemons. And they would pick lemons and put them in boxes and carry the boxes and, and move them out. And workers would pull straws in order to see who could work with my great-grandfather. Everybody wanted to work with my great-grandfather. And the reason they, they wanted to work with him, and this is the stories that they told me, was because he told incredible stories and jokes so while you're working in the hot sun, picking the lemons yeah, all day more long, enjoyable. yeah, he yeah. would tell these great stories and these great jokes. And so everybody fought to work with him. Now, here's the other side of it. He also was known as uh, being one of the most productive workers. In fact, whoever worked with him produced more, were able to pick more lemons or whatever than they would had they not. Why? Because they were enjoying themselves because they found a way to love what they were doing. So it reminded me of, uh, of that story. Um, now, the next one, this one I've, I've heard before, but it kind of does make sense. And I have a personal story for this. So years ago, and I, I even said it earlier in this episode, years ago, I, uh, you know, I worked in big gyms and then I transitioned and owned my own uh, personal training studio. But there's actually a period of time in between that, about eight months long, that I didn't work in the fitness space. I had thought when I left big, big box gyms, which... Here's what it was like working in a big box gym for me when I was a general manager. I would get in at 8 or 9 a.m. and I would come home 9 or 10 p.m. and it was six days a week. It was a lot of work. I made good money, but it was a lot of work. Now, I enjoyed the hell out of it, but at this point, I was you know thinking about starting a family. I'm like, this is a lot of hours. This is really crazy. Um, I know I'm good with, with my words and I'm good in sales. Let me see if I can do something else that's less hours and maybe gets me more money. My aunt worked uh, in the banking industry and she said, you know, maybe I'll get you an interview so you can talk to my boss and see if you can get in on the investment side and you can make good money and your hour, you know, you work banker's hours, right? So nine to five or really you work nine to three or four, by the way, when I was in the bank, everybody was out of there by that time. So I said, let me give it a shot. So I went in, got interviewed. They hired me and I did the, I got my, my, my series six and 63 license and eventually I was going to get a series seven license and all that stuff. And so I'm taking the test and doing the whole thing and I'm working in the bank and, and I found myself uh, half the time I was in the bank talking to people about fitness, talking to people about nutrition, giving people workouts, my coworkers, the, the people coming into the bank, like this is what I was talking about all the time. Mm -hmm. And when I wasn't talking about that, I was looking up at the clock waiting for lunchtime so I could take my break, waiting for four o'clock so I could go home. And I realized that um, what I would do for free, and this is the next one, is talk about fitness. Think about that. If you want to work in a way that serves your purpose, think to yourself, what would I, li what would I do for free? For me, talking about fitness and health and self-improvement is something that I did in a job that had almost nothing to do with it because I enjoyed doing it so much. It's something mm -hmm. that I would do for free. I would do this podcast uh, for free. Oh, well, we I, did. Yeah, I, I was just <laughs> we gonna, did yeah, for a whole year. Yeah, we did. I was going to say, we all did that. Well, not only did we do that, but even, so, you know, 
we recently have, you know, we set and did our, you know, set up buy sell agreements. And I think that's a responsible thing for us to do. You know, Doug's getting old. We want to make sure in case he dies, <laughs> yeah. and, he'll outlive all of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that's the truth. There, really. it's really, <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us are worried we're going to go sooner, right? Yeah. No, really, it's a responsible thing for us to do at this point. Is like, you know, what all the what ifs? You know, what if somebody left? What if someone passed away? Yada yada. So we we've had to do that, right? And part of that goes uh, of, of getting to that place. Uh, we had to do evaluation on the businesses and. You know, it was pretty interesting to see, like, oh, if we were to actually sell off, what it would look like. And one of the thing that uh, things that everybody said is like, you know, even if we got paid ten x of what the even the valuation is, like, what would you guys do? And we all agreed, like, I'd still want a podcast. I still wouldn't want to not do that. So all the money in the world being paid out to us wouldn't make a difference on we still doing this or not. That to me is a real good sign that you're aligned with what you should be doing. You know, whatever amount of money that someone could pay you for it doesn't even matter. You would still do it, whether you're not getting paid or you got paid all in the money of the world and you don't necessarily need to work anymore. Would you still get up and go to work? Dude, people mm -hmm. don't realize like when we started the podcast, we were all working. Okay. I, I had my personal training studio. Justin was training. Adam was doing uh, his own business and we're building a social media business on the side at that time. All of us had full-time. Doug uh, was selling insurance. We were all working full-time. And what we used to do is we would meet first in Doug's living room and then uh, in a tiny little cramped studio. Um, and we would meet there at like six o'clock at night or whatever after we worked. So after full days of work mm -hmm. and we would sit there and record till 10 o'clock at night yeah. and we got and paid have a blast and we got paid nothing. Yeah. We got paid nothing for a full year of just sitting in, you know, we had no podcast experience, no media experience. Um, I mean, you ask us then we thought we would have been great, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but the reality is the odds were way against us. But one thing I remember about that was we would come in and end of the day, I'm tired. As soon as I walk in, we start talking the mics. We're talking about health. We're talking about fitness. We'll talk about you know self improvement and lifting weights and all this other stuff that we love talking about and talking to each other. And four hours, five hours, we felt like ten minutes. Mm -hmm. It was like ten minutes. It was gone. Um, and that was crazy to me. It's like you Thankfully, know, figure out how to monetize it. Yeah, <laughs> it's like you, you know what though that we we led with one of the other important points that we met or uh, pointed out though, like the desired outcome was really to provide as much free, valuable information. It was that, serving others. Yeah, yeah definitely. it really was. And it wasn't like okay, how are we going to turn this into a cash cow and how are we going to make a bunch of money? It's like hey, listen, there is a lot of bad information out there. We've got a ton of experience, and we want to shed light on that and give to all these people. We'll figure out if it's meant to be a business later. I looked at it as, as super valuable just for my clients. I mean, I was still training all these clients, and I would have these conversations with them after we were done with our sessions. Yes. You know, it's just, it was an extension of that. It felt like, to me, like, I'm... I, I always like to, to be available if I know something to pass it on to somebody. And that's really rewarding. And I felt like, you know, this is what we were doing in the beginning. So it didn't feel like we were working. Right, right. Um, now, the next one, this is this one kind of goes back to what you were talking about earlier, Adam, when you said, you know, if you pass and you want a stadium full of people, um, it's asking yourself, what is going to be your legacy? You know, how do you want to be remembered? I think this can kind of shed light a little bit in terms of what your purpose is. Maybe like what are the things you want to be remembered for if you were to pass away in a year? Um, is it because do you want to be remembered for you know having the 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 you know biggest biceps, uh, being the most shredded, for being the most fit, having the most money? Probably not. It's probably something like I'd like to be remembered by people. You know, if I think off the top of my head, I'd like to be remem be remembered as being someone who's kind. Mm -hmm. I'd like to be remembered as somebody that uh, wasn't afraid to stand up for other people. Uh, I would like to be remembered by my children and my grandchildren as being uh, somebody that led uh, the way. You know, the legacy, I think, is important. That legacy question, I think it helps us take things off that we think maybe we, you know, we're driven towards and we think, wait a minute, maybe that isn't my purpose because I really don't care if I'm remembered you know, by that thing right there. Yeah, it's stuff with more substance. You know, that's what lasts. And and that's, I think, too, like, to me, it, it speaks like integrity. And and uh, that's a big one for me. I want to be remembered, uh, you know, for uh, sort of following the the values that I, I hold dear and being consistent with that. 
and uh, and also being kind and being fair and uh, you know those types of things that uh, I want to be a better model and example uh, for my kids to look at you know like where I got to uh, so that way that that to me has way more meaning and more legacy and then if anybody else looks at that as an example and can benefit then I'm even more happy I feel like mine's summed up in one word I want to I want to be remembered as a great leader uh, and a lot of the things that we're talking about, um, in order to be a great leader, uh, you need to encompass all these things. We had a recent episode too, about, uh, being a great dad. It's the same, same thing, you know, the attributes that it takes, I think, to be a great father, I think the, uh, the ways to find purpose, all these, all these attributes I think are, are all encompassing in being a great leader. If you've got this all kind of figured out, I think you'll, you'll lead a life like that and others will look to you like that. And I think that that's where this comes from with the whole, you know, narcissistic sounding uh, stadium thing, right? <laughs> it's like, it's not uh, that I, I want to be famous at all. Like, I, I just, I want to have led a life where others had looked up to what I had pr- provided or given to them, like a life of service that everybody goes, you know, oh my God, he was kind. Oh my God, he was humble. Oh, he was strong. He was confident. He gave me this. I have all, I want people to have received a ton from me and feel that way that I never asked for anything in return. And then that's their way of coming there and showing up. Oh, so. you, you you end up leaving people better off than uh, had you not been around. Right. That's the legacy. I, I yep. talked to my grandfather um, a couple of weeks ago. You know, my grandfather now is, uh, you know, he's, he's up there in age. He's 89 and uh, he's now has stage four prostate cancer and it's in his bones and he's doing okay right now. But, you, you know, it's obviously we're being faced with the fact that my grandfather is probably not going to be around uh, much longer and he's being faced with that. And I remember I was sitting sitting with him at the dinner table and uh, I'd never had him tell me like really, you know, from beginning to end, how he came to America, what that whole process looked like. And I mean, what a tough uh, situation. I mean, he, he first had to go to, he was very, very poor, had to go to Venezuela and his wife was behind in Italy and he'd send her back money. And then she came on a boat to meet him there and they both went back to Sicily. Then he came to America and he came through, you know, Chicago, and then eventually made it to California. So he's telling me his whole story of how we worked, and he cleaned movie theaters. He was a custodian at, at, at you know, schools. He worked in factories, and he's telling me this whole story. And then he gets uh, a little teary eyed, and he says, "You know, Sally goes well, right now because you know we all, were, my whole family was there." He goes, "I look at my house, and it's full with all my kids, all my grandkids." And even some of my great grandkids, and he goes, uh, I could die right now, and I'll be very happy. He goes, I this is m- the legacy that I left, that I started, um, and uh, I mean, I- incredible, right? And I thought to myself, well, yeah, that's that sounds that sounds like a pretty damn good uh, good purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, now this next one, I think, helps you find your purpose because I know this is a challenge for some people. I think sometimes people sit around and, oh, what's my purpose? What am I doing? What's the deal? You know what can help a lot is to surround yourself with people who seem to be driven by a sense of purpose. It really does help. It helps a lot. It's contagious. It is totally contagious. I mean, if, if you surround yourself with people who don't seem to have any direction or sense of purpose, um, you know, you're, you're probably going to fall in the same situation. Or at least if you don't have a, a sense of purpose yet, it'll be hard to find one, especially if you're around other people who don't have one. Themselves. What do they say? You are the sum of the five people. You yeah, you're an the av- most? you're an average of the people, the five people you spend the most time with. And I believe in that. Yeah, I, I believe that in that from everything, from financially, spiritually, all the things that you could talk about. That those people, uh, what they make up, you are an average of of all of that for sure. And in, I, w- I wish I understood that better, even younger. Mm-hmm. Uh, it took me a while, probably my mid twenties, before this this started to come together for me, and it probably took me into my thirties before I I really really figured it out and evaluated it more often because it's hard. You know, a, a lot of us are attached to certain people for whatever reason, and many times, by the way, uh, the things that draw us together are shit that has to do with insecurities and stuff, stuff that. Um, you you have, are dealing with, and so you're drawn to that person because you guys find that in common, right? So you guys can both bitch about it. Yeah, it's, it's it's true. And even if it, you don't intentionally do that, subconsciously, we we it we're, it's natural for us to gravitate to others that we are a lot alike. And so if you're still young and you attach yourself to this circle of people that are all struggling with the same shit you are, it's real. It's a quick, easy way for you to get stuck in that place for a very long time. Uh, you want to be reaching for people that are 
uh, reaching for to be a better person and to be do better in their life. And so evaluating that circle of five all the time, I think, is well, extremely important. Well, what it is is if you if you're hanging around a bunch of people who are not purpose driven, who don't challenge you, um, you're you're comfortable. You're definitely comfortable. It's easy, you know. You might feel like you're the you're the best. You're sitting in a room but full. You're not of, growing. You sir, you know, sitting around in a, in a room full of guys and girls that aren't doing much with their life, and you think, hey, it's not so bad. I'm not doing so bad, and you know, I'm not. I know I haven't gone very far. I don't have much drive, but whatever. So these people all around me, it's definitely uncomfortable to constantly be surrounded by people who are driven by purpose because it'll challenge you to to ref, to look on yourself, and it's hard. When you are not feeling driven, not feeling a sense of purpose, not doing the things that we just said in this in this podcast, and then you're surrounded by people who do, mm-hmm. you know, you're surrounded by people who who have all your similar circumstances, and yet they continue to do these other things, that'll make you uncomfortable. So it's not necessarily easy, but it is extremely valuable. So this is why it's good to surround yourself with with purpose driven people because it'll constantly challenge you to be that person yourself. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio, so you can come check us out on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. You can also find all of us on Instagram, including Doug, the producer. You can find Doug at Mind Pump Bug, Doug, Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Mind, Mind Pump, Pump Bug. Bug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My bug, bug, bug it. <laughs> Doug the bug. Yeah, new nickname. Yes, <laughs> Doug the bug. Doug the bug. I'm more competitive. I can't than you. say that I'm the best at anything in the world. Mm. Right? Can you guys say that at all? No. Right. Uh, no. No. Right. Yeah. No, actually, he's the guy over here to think uh, about it. Yeah. He's, he's like, like yeah. well, let me I'm think about. Kind it. of the best. I'm, at, uh, nah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. pretty good at a lot <laughs> of things. Probably somebody else. I'm pretty good at a lot of things. Let me think here real quick. <laughs> I'm also the best at being humble. He's like, I'm pretty. <laughs> 